Hello and welcome to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Scott Craig. Britain is faced with the choice, a fork in the road, over something which has formed the bedrock of the country's national security and defence policy for decades, nuclear weapons. The Trident programme will be approaching the end of their lifespan towards the end of the 2020s, and it may sound a long way off, but a decision needs to be taken by 2016 over whether to renew the programme. But what was once a given has now become a political debate here in the UK, with the coalition government divided over the issue. But aside from the politics, how important is Trident to Britain's future security? And what does the debate say about future defence thinking? Who is the deterrent aimed at? Who is it deterring? North Korea? Iran? or even Russia, as some suggest. And it was once said that nuclear weapons were the price paid to sit at the top table of international affairs. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined in the studio by Paul Ingram, Executive Director at BASIC, the British American Security Information Council. Alexandra Swan is from UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party. She's been a vocal supporter of Trident's renewal. Hugh Chalmers is a nuclear research analyst at the Royal United Services Institute, RUSI, and he's written extensively about the UK and nuclear weapons. Weapons. And joining us for the first part of the programme is the voice of Russia's political analyst, Dmitry Babich, who's in our Moscow studio. Let me come to each of you in the studio first, just briefly to get your uh, very quick reaction. Is Trident necessary in the 21st century, Paul? I don't think it is necessary, uh, not for Britain and not for the world. I think uh, it's important that uh, we do, all of us, move down the ladder of uh, nuclear weapons in a world where uh, otherwise uh, more and more countries will possess them and uh, it will become increasingly dangerous. There is no logic to uh, the current possession of nuclear weapons. Alexander. I think the primary role of government is obviously defence of the realm and sadly at the moment I think there still is a need to have a nuclear deterrent. Now this is looking up to 2060 and as we've seen it's been a very precarious decade across the world. We don't know which new threats might emerge. We have Iran and North Korea um, nuclear weapons and I think at the moment yes we do need to have a strong nuclear deterrent. Uh, Hugh, I know you've written extensively. In fact, I was reading one of your papers in which you were writing about nuclear cooperation between the UK and the US. In that sense, are nuclear weapons for the UK necessary because they're so tied in with the American security structure and infrastructure? I think it's important to acknowledge that while that is a very vital part of the UK-US relationship, it's not the only part of the UK-US relationship. And furthermore, the, the, a decision on whether or not to renew or how to renew our nuclear deterrent shouldn't really be based solely on how our allies might see it. Well, that's an important thing to remember. It's not the most important determinant. Dimitri, from the Russian government's perspective, I mean, Russia has also been investing heavily in nuclear weapons. I mean, according to some estimate, $150 billion or so in renewing its forces. Clearly, the Russian government sees that nuclear weapons are also an important part of its security in the future. Why is that? Well, I mean, most of this money is not invested in production of new nuclear weapons. It's just the cost of keeping and maintaining the arsenal that we already have. There were many suggestions, uh, including some suggestions from the United States, to cut our arsenals with the United States uh, to a figure below the 100, 100, uh, 1,500 uh, warheads. Uh, but uh, there are some dissenting voices saying that actually if we cut our arsenals to the level of three or 400 warheads, uh, then it will be a temptation. It would create a temptation for China and other so-called minor nuclear players uh, to get even with us. And instead of bringing the world more security, it can make the world more insecure. Uh, but certainly nuclear weapons are, are a liability for the Russian budget. And uh, if you look at the recent history since the early 90s, uh, the Russian Duma and the government have been actually and nudging the United States towards uh, greater reductions in nuclear weapons. You know, the problem was that the United States could easily maintain their nuclear potential uh, from a financial point of view, while for Russia, which was uh, basically a much poorer country than now uh, before the year 2000, it was a really heavy burden. Well, right now, uh, it looks like Russia will just retain the potential that we have now, 
And uh, I don't hear many warning voices about what's going on in Europe, uh, but recently I visited a conference in the Institute of International Economic Relations in Moscow, and there were some interesting figures. Uh, people there actually said that despite the fact that Western Europe controls uh, you know, less than 3% of, of the world's nuclear weapons, Western Europe is the only area in the world where governments have official plans of getting more nuclear weapons, actually expanding their, their nuclear arsenals. And that's a worrisome trend. Hugh, if we look at the debate around Trident, uh, the renewal of Trident, is that an expansion of the UK's nuclear capability or is it simply a renewal of what already exists? How will that be seen by other nuclear states? It's a very interesting question because um, uh, the debate has always happened around the idea of whether or not we're going to have a like-for-like -like replacement of the current system. And um, the government policy announced actually in 2010 was that we were going to reduce the number of warheads on the next system. We were going to reduce the number of missiles on the next system. So even if we were to essentially follow the exact same model as what we have at the moment, we would still have fewer warheads on boats. We would still have fewer missiles on boats. And importantly, despite, um, I'm not quite sure where Dimitri heard his figures from, but the UK official policy is that we will not have any more than 120 operational warheads at any time, and we will have no more than 180 in total in our entire stockpile. And that's been steadily coming down for quite a long time. I want to bring in something that the uh, Defence Secretary in the UK, Philip Hammond, uh, said on the BBC Today programme uh, when he was asked about this question about Trident. He said, we've got countries like Iran and North Korea attempting to build nuclear weapons and already possessing long-range missiles. We can't say who the potential adversary might be in the future. Russia is investing $150 billion in renewing its forces. We can't say where the threats will come from. Is that implying that the UK still views Russia as a potential nuclear foe in your, in your view, Paul? Uh, let's make no mistake about it. The British Trident system is about Russia. It's not about Iran. It's not about North Korea. There are no scenarios in which Britain will face either of those countries alone. Uh, this is about a backward-looking uh, focus. It's about the fear that Britain may face a, a, a Russia that is resurgent, that changes its, 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 its attitude. I think this is a huge mistake. I think that what Dimitri has outlined, um, I would argue with on a factual basis, but the underlying point is that the nuclear policies in Europe, not so much Western Europe actually, but certainly the former Soviet uh, republics, um, is based upon fear and is based upon a legacy that goes back. Now, our challenge, be us, whether, whether we are Russians or British or, or Europeans, is to overcome that paranoia, that fear, and to actually look forward towards the 21st century rather than back to the 20th century. And one of the first steps that we could do in this country is to abandon the plans to renew Trident. But this is a challenge that doesn't just face Britain. It's a challenge that faces Russians as well. We need to move beyond this idea of simply balancing, which is a cold war war attitude and, and move rather to creating and deepening positive diplomatic and social cultural relationships between our countries so that war can no longer be uh, contemplated and nuclear weapons can be abolished once and for all. Alexandra Swan, let me bring you in here. I mean, this is, you know, as Paul said, this is essentially a very Cold War way of looking at things. I mean, in the 21st century, is this country's security going to be tied up in that Cold War way of thinking with a, a missile system that is essentially designed to flatten Moscow? Philip Hammond's comments bringing Russia into this are actually very interesting on another level. They really show um, the splits with, between between the coalition government. So Philip Hammond, the Conservative Minister, mentions uh, Russia. And then you have in the same week Nick Clegg quoting that, well, a quote of Nick Clegg's saying that our nuclear capacities are no longer about being able to flush, um, flatten Moscow with a push of a button. So it just shows the, very, you know, the differences between the coalition partners. And whilst, as you say, Trident is very much geared towards, uh, towards you know, old Cold War attitudes, so I think there is definitely an argument for replacement systems where we still have a nuclear deterrent, but it's not quite sort of opposed in that sense.
But do you think that that doctrine, which was essentially the doctrine that that this country's foreign policy, international relations, defense policy was built around, is still a valid one? I mean, who are we deterring? Are we deterring the Russians? Are we deterring Iran? Are we deterring North Korea? I mean, that that doctrine, is it still as applicable to security today? Well, I think it is, yes, because... We have never, um, we, I don't think England ever would, Britain ever would, propose nuclear weapons for anything but deterrent. Now, obviously, deterrence is in the eye of, eye of the deterred. Um, so to, we don't know who we're deterring, and that is, that is the issue here. I don't think, from a, it's definitely not a UKIP policy to look at the potential uh, enemies of Russia, but this is looking up to, you know, sort of 2060. We don't know what's going to happen. The world's a very unstable place. We have North, we, North Korea and Iran are arguably run by fairly unstable leaders. Um, we just don't know. And to take, I mean, the, one of the, stri- uh, the strongest arguments against renewing Trident is money. But I just don't think you can put a price on national security. Hugh Chalmers, who are we deterring? I think Paul made a very good point in that essentially um, the way that we have approached our deterrent over the last kind of 10 years, uh, given that the Cold War is over, does seem to be fairly reminiscent of a kind of a Soviet era style mentality. But um, also Alexander was right to point out this looks up to 2060. I think importantly, um, the way that the government has phrased it in the past is that this is the ultimate deterrent to deter the most extreme threats. So they don't even really specify in any way what those threats might be. It's just the most extreme threats that we might face in the future. So they don't have to necessarily say who exactly they're going to be deterring over the over however long it lasts, up to 2060, because they don't know who it could be come 2050, come 2060. But what they do know is that these weapons are extremely powerful, these weapons are extremely scary, and that they know how to use them as a deterrent. They've had a lot of practice with how to use these things as a deterrent to scare people off. My problem with that, Hugh, and it's because it's the fundamental argument that the government relies upon is this idea of uncertainty, is that if we are... justifying the investment of so many billions today on uncertainty, that will always be the case. We live in a world of uncertainty. It is one of the things that the Americans have found very difficult to come to terms with, that in the end it is impossible to reach full security. If we always believe that nuclear weapons are necessary because there will be uncertainty, then all the rhetoric that the Russians, that the Americans, that the British and all the other nuclear weapon states have used about a world free of nuclear weapons, the legal commitments under the Non-Proliferation Treaty are a sham. And actually, the majority world, living without nuclear weapons, are seeing through that sham today. And this is the danger, because if Iran gets hold of nuclear weapons, which they will, if we just carry on the way we are going. And I'm against Iran getting nuclear weapons, but I very much understand the way in which they perceive this to be an in, in unjust situation. We will have the use of nuclear weapons. And all listeners need to understand that the use of nuclear weapons is absolutely horrific. And we, this generation, have a responsibility to get rid of them now because the only alternative is not nuclear deterrence into the indefinite future. It is the use of nuclear weapons. I think I I do agree with you to a certain extent. However, if we start reducing our nuclear capacity and we don't renew Trident and say Russia was to reduce those two, uh, theirs two, and America as well, that's not going to stop Iran wanting to get nuclear weapons. It's just going to stop us having a deterrent against them using them against us. Mm. As somebody who visits Iran on a regular basis, the rhetoric and the narrative within Iran is how can we sit back and allow the nuclear weapon states to continue to hold all the power in the international system? It's very appealing to Iranians to hear radical Uh, perspectives from their leaders that say the only way to challenge well they don't say this but they the underlying implication is the only way to challenge the uh, those states with all the power in the system is to challenge them at their own game because we can't we Iranians can't just sit back and allow them to to constrain our development as they always have for decades we can't allow them to play politics with the Middle East and uh, to the detriment of Iranians we In our part of the world, the Brits, live in the safest corner of the safest continent and we feel that we can't get rid of nuclear weapons. Who are we to lecture the Iranians? That's fair enough. It's a very big leap of faith to make, assuming that they won't still build them. 
You're listening to The Voice of Russia. Today we're discussing the future of the UK's Trident nuclear weapons program. We've been talking about whom are we deterring. I don't know of any serious analysis that suggests that Britain and Russia, the West and Russia, will be engaged in some kind of conflict in the future that could involve nuclear weapons. But if you were Iran, if you were North Korea, you think from your perspective that power is tied up in developing a nuclear weapon. In other words, there's a proliferation aspect to this argument, isn't there, Hugh? Well, I think it's important not to overemphasize the uh, the kind of political value that nuclear weapons can get. They, it, they are naturally tied up in a lot of people's minds in the evolution of the UK's place in the international scene. But it's really hard to say where we would be right now in the international scene if we didn't have nuclear weapons. I think that there are a number of states out there that have chosen not to develop nuclear weapons and have become major players in the region or even in, their, in, in the world. Japan, for instance, you know, lies not particularly far from a nuclear weapons capability, but has no real desire to pursue them, not because they're, they don't wish to kind of have a bigger presence in the world, but because they're very well, much aware that nuclear weapons and the pursuit of nuclear weapons does not buy you influence directly. Let's talk about the cost. Uh, official estimates uh, are, say, 15 to 20 billion pounds, I think, is the official estimate. A lot of analysis says the true cost could be higher, around 30 billion pounds or so. I mean, is there a point at which we say that the financial investment in this simply isn't worth the security dividend that we get from it, uh, Alexandra? The only real proper function of a government is to protect its citizens. And I just, again, I don't think you can put a price on security. Now, whether or not there is a risk um, and whether or not we need them full stop it is the question, not how much they're going to cost if we do use them, if but we do have them, sorry. But if we are talking about 15 to 20 billion pounds, isn't that money that could be better spent on smaller, more flexible forces that are more more reliant on technology, say intelligence, gathering drones, etc.? Aren't those the kinds of conflicts that we're going to be involved in in the future? and that um, money could therefore be better spent in those areas. That's highly possible. And I think that's why there's this, um, the Trident Alternatives Review is coming out, and well, it's come out, and people are really discussing what alternatives we could use. Now, I'm no personal like, expert in the intricacies of, of nuclear weapons, but I assume, you know, we have, we have people looking at which is the most effective. Now, we have to find something that's most cost effective uh, and will deliver security. But we shouldn't stop, you know, get rid of our nuclear deterrent purely based on cost. Paul Ingram, if the country were to decide, and I mean, it looks as though it is not going to, I mean, it looks like it is a foregone conclusion that the country will renew its nuclear weapons program in, in one form or another. I mean, the Trident Review has has laid out the, the alternatives very clearly. Um, if, hypothetically, the UK were to uh, not give the same level of commitment to nuclear weapons as it is now, doesn't that send a pretty strong message internationally that could damage the UK's international standing? I think it would show confidence. Uh, it would show that Britain actually recognises that uh, the value that we attach to nuclear weapons is a fetish. Uh, I mean, just to underline this in another context, if the Arabs were to say, um, actually, the Israeli nuclear weapons are irrelevant to the whole dimension of Middle East politics. Uh, they're not usable. They're not usable either in, in actual use or even in a deterrent capability because, you know, if, if Israel were to use nuclear weapons, the blowback would be huge. They are irrelevant. They are useless. We're not going to, we're not going to pay any attention. Israel can carry on spending their money and wasting their resources, but we are going to work towards a region free of nuclear weapons. That very act would be an act of confidence and the reputation of the Arabs would rise dramatically. I think the same would, would happen in Britain. If, if Britain were to decide in a proactive, positive way to say, actually, the 21st century requires us to move beyond this, uh, then the fetish would start to die away and the status would actually rise rather than fall. But you've got five former defence secretaries, some Conservative, some Labour, all of whom are saying that it is important to renew Trident for security reasons, not bombers, not missile silos, not cruise missiles, Trident. These are people who probably don't agree on very much elsewhere. <laughs> But they're all saying that Trident is the way to go. What they agree on is that nuclear weapons uh, on continuous patrol is essential to Britain's status and security. I disagree with them on that. And this is not 
a sophisticated military conversation. This is a political prejudice uh, on both sides of this debate, uh, but built upon a very sophisticated and long and extensive public debate that this country has had over the many decades. W one thing I feel proud about, about being British, is that the, the debate on this issue has gone along and has been more informed than pretty much any other country on the planet. Is your analysis that a like-for-like -like replacement is what is actually necessary to provide Britain with the level of security which the main political parties say they want? You? I think importantly, when you consider what is necessary for UK security, um, it's very, very hard for any one person to say with any real authority what we actually need. A lot of threats that arrive in the future are entirely unexpected which makes the, um, the resolution of this debate extremely hard. Um, I doubt that um, any one party can be able to authoritatively claim that they know exactly what threats the UK is going to be facing in 2050 or 2060. So my analysis is, is that you would have to pick a system that has the most flexibility mm -hmm. to be able to deal with the, the vast range of potential threats that may come in the future. And Trident would fit that bill? Well, Trident has a very, very specific purpose in that it really, from the UK's perspective, is meant to deter um, you know, an enormous uh, World War II style conventional attack on the UK or deter a nuclear attack on the UK or potentially even to deter uh, a chemical or a biological or radiological attack on the UK. Now, importantly, most of these things are not considered at the moment as a tier one threat. Um, whilst we do worry about the idea of a terrorist use of chemical weapons, biological weapons, maybe even a nuclear weapon, you have to question just how effective um, a submarine patrolling underneath the ocean with ballistic missiles armed with nuclear warheads would be in deterring a terrorist that has proven himself perfectly willing to, uh, to destroy his own life for his cause. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. Today we're discussing the future of the UK's nuclear weapons program Trident with my guests Paul Ingram, Alexandra Swan and Hugh Chalmers. I mean, Alexandra, that's an important point, isn't it? The kinds of threats that we look increasingly likely to face are things like the terrorist with, with a bomb in a city, the potential for uh, the so-called dirty bomb, you know, some kind of radiological device or a chemical attack or a biological attack. And these are things which uh, a Trident-based nuclear weapon system simply won't deter. Well, absolutely. Um, and I've, that's why I very much agree with you that we need a flexible system. Um, and of course, you're right. If you look, you know, no terrorist is going to be deterred by Trident. And a lot of the you know, terrorist groups, the stateless groups, well, say there was a, an Al Qaeda, um, for example, dirty bomb in London. Where would we bomb? Where, where would we send a nuclear missile? We wouldn't. And you know, time and time again, this has been proven. You know, America might have evaded. Afghanistan, Iraq, but they didn't nuke them because of uh, individuals and terrorist groups. So, you know, there is, a, there is a strong argument. Paul, there is this the insurance policy quality to Trident, isn't there? That, okay, we don't know the kinds of threats that we're going to face in the future. Planners in the MOD, they spend a very long time trying to anticipate what future threats are going to be. But simply put, we don't really know. Don't we therefore need to retain that ultimate insurance policy? There are a lot of threats we do have a very clear idea about. And we, d we can uh, take uh, trends and, and, and carry them forward. We know that there will be a massive problem around population, uh, around climate change, and around a num numerous other major global threats. Now, if we continue to possess nuclear weapons, that will undermine the essential global cooperation that is required. You think it, it really is that stark that countries are not going to cooperate with each other simply because some possess nuclear weapons? Yes, I think that this contributes this this mentality the nuclear weapons encourages contributes to the to undermining the ca the capacity for us to cooperate more effectively and i just use a very simple example which will resonate with the with the listeners and that is the relationship between the two largest military powers on this planet. Uh, if it weren't for the continued possession and development of nuclear weapons, there would be a much better relationship between the United States and Russia, and indeed between Europe and Russia. Hugh, do we need to somewhat rethink the way that power works in the 21st century, the, away from this, this emphasis on sort of brute military force towards things like intelligence, technology, soft power, so-called? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's fairly clear that that debate, that discussion, that reformulation of how power works in the 21st century is already happening. 
Um, I think it's hard to see how um, you know information uh, exchanges, kind of the, the use of social networking, uh, the, the manner in which we've seen protests erupt, kind of in kind of close tandem around the world, suggests that you know there is that change happening, um, but it's not necessarily clear whether or not that debate is happening in the higher levels of places like you know the Ministry of Defence or at the highest top tables in political parties because what they have to worry about at the end of the day is when once they've finished being prime minister and they've moved on can they proudly say that they safeguarded the you know the, the security of their nation and they didn't let any threat come through and that they were the most kind of upstanding secure prime minister there were um I think that's where their main focus is, not necessarily on that debate. Alexandra, obviously you're from a political party and obviously security is a politicised issue in a sense. But how do you disassociate the politics of it from the philosophical national security of it? Um, Well, that's an interesting question. And it's one that people should very much think about because the massive risk here um, is that people... because of the politics of Trident and nuclear weapons on the whole. And I think the, the worry is, and if, if uh, the British government is going to renew or change or whatever they're going to do with our nuclear capacity, they should be doing it before the next general election because there's this huge fear that the Liberal Democrats, if there's another hung parliament, they'll use nuclear weapons to bully whichever partner they're with, whether it's Labour or the Conservatives, and it will become about politics, not about national security. On whether or not this should be a political issue or not, I think it's important to remember that it is a political issue, and it will always be a political issue. Um, when the previous Labour government approached whether or not they should replace the uh, the nuclear deterrent, they did put it to a, a vote in the House of Parliament. And these things will be put to a, a vote in the House of Parliament, which makes it unavoidably a political issue. And something that Paul mentioned earlier that um, I think we all should be extremely proud of is the fact that the UK is one of the very few nuclear armed states out there that makes sure that such a, a, a large part of our defence policy is debated and is debated quite openly. I feel like um, to remove... Uh, politics and to remove the public from this type of decision um, is uh, is a worrying move. Paul, is there a sort of national prestige issue to this that, you know, Britain is a member of the club and as such shouldn't give up nuclear weapons because it will cease to be a member of the club and therefore not just on a, a kind of flippant level, but that actually means something internationally? Well, there's there's, there's two dimensions to that. The, the, the first is is about pure status and that is rarely expressed uh, but deeply held that possessing nuclear weapons the ultimate weapon brings us status the other dimension is that it it gives us a seat at the table of nuclear weapon states to be able to influence negotiations around disarmament it's often said if we got rid of our nuclear weapons we would no longer be able to play this a, a positive role in leadership I reject both. Um, uh, Britain will always be a nuclear weapon state under the definition of the NPT and will always have a seat at the table. I think, as I said earlier, status uh, is one that is in the eye of the beholder and, and actually the majority world, which is actually increasingly where we need to be focusing our obsession with status and relationship, is actually much more on the side of getting rid of nuclear weapons. I think that's about all the time that we have for the discussion this week. No doubt the debate will go on. And uh, my thanks to my guests, uh, Paul Ingram from BASIC, Alexandra Swan from UKIP, Hugh Chalmers from RUSI, and Dimitri Babbage from Moscow. But for me, Scott Craig and the rest of the team here, thanks for listening.